بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وبارك على الأشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم أما بعد Alhamdulillah, in the previous lesson we covered uh, Salat al-Khawf, the prayer of fear. And today, inshallah, we'll be talking about Salat al-Jum'ah, the Jum'ah prayer, the Friday prayer, along with some of the ahkam, the rulings in relation to it, the wajibat and the mustahabbat, the things that are obligatory with Jum'ah. Things are recommended for Jum'ah. And insha'Allah ta'ala, this will actually be the final chapter that we'll be discussing and going through from Kitab al-Salah. This is the final chapter from Kitab al-Salah that we'll be going through. Reason being is that the chapter after this is the the chapter regarding the Salat al Eidain, the Salah pertaining to the two Eids. However, on the lesson, of, I think it was the Monday prior to Eid al Adha, we went through that, that, that chapter and we discussed all of the points in regards to the yani Eid and uh, the points related to the Salat al Eidain. So, inshallah, this will, as we mentioned, be the final. Chapter in pertaining to the Kitab of Salah, I mean, Book of Salah. Wallahu ta'ala, a'lam. Now, and so, Ibn Qadama, he begins by mentioning relation to the Salat of Jum'ah, the kul man lazimatuhu al maktuba lazimatuhu al Jum'ah. إن كان إذا كان مستوطنا لبناء. And so every individual who is obligatory for him, in whom is obligatory for him to pray the salah, yeah, the obligatory prayers, then the salat al Jum'a is upon him. نعم. شيخنا شيخ عبيد رحمه الله he mentions that the Jum'ah, Salat al Jum'ah, is upon five specific individuals. Five specific individuals. The first of them is the one that is Nida. So the one that hears the Adhan. So if the individual hears the Adhan, then the Salat al Jum'ah becomes a believer upon them. The second is a dukur yani the males, the men. So it's an obligation for the men to pray Salatul Jum'ah. The third is al bulugh So the individual has reached and surpassed the stage of puberty. The fourth is al aql that the person is of sound mind. And the fifth is a shuriya. The fifth is a shuriya. That individual is free. Essentially, they're not enslaved. These are the five individuals, or the five conditions, if you like, in order for the individual to be regarded as one that has to establish. The Jum'ah. And so, within that, Ibn Qudama, he mentions as well that the person has to be Mustotinan, yani that their person is a resident. So they're resident in, in wherever they are. So, <coughs> If you live in the, in the, in the area and you're a resident, then the Jum'ah is also an obligation upon you. 
Now, thereafter, it mentions illa mar'a wal abd wal musafir wal ma'zur marad aw matar aw khawf. Now, and so Ibn Qudama mentions here now, Rahimahullah, Ya'ani the exceptions. So he mentions who is an obligation upon, and then he mentions exceptions for who, and for whom the Salat or Jum'ah is not. So the first of them is the Mar'ah, the woman. Na'am, the first of them is the woman. Na'am. And so, this is due to the hadith of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam found in Sunan Abi Dawud where the Nabi Alayhi Salatu Wasallam mentions the hadith of Tariq Ibn Shihab Tariq Ibn Shihab he narrates and the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam قال الجمع حق واجب على كل مسلم إلا أربعة so the Jum'ah is an obligation upon every Muslim except for four, the four individuals. Mamluk, or Mar'a, or Sabi, or Marid. So it's an obligation upon the, it's an obligation upon all except for the Mamluk, the one who is owned. If we refer, refer to one that is owned, then no doubt it's referring to the, the state, the Abd. The Imra, the woman, the Sabi, the child, all the Murid, the one who is sick. And so this narration here is one which is found in the Sunan of Abi Dawud as mentioned, and is a narration which is regarded as being uh, Sahih. Allah Ta'ala A'lam And so due to this narration as we mentioned This is why we have These conditions of Who the Salah Salah to Jum'ah is an obligation upon So this is the first uh, Exception So who can remember the exceptions We mentioned So we have the exceptions of the child The woman The sick the slave and the tra the trap the musi the musafir the traveller we said naam and someone said something matar naam and something was included within that though matar not just matar not just rain but what so a person generally has uh they have they generally have an excuse. They're genuine, they're genuinely excused. I said an excuse falls under three. Now the one that has an excuse it falls under three. So you have the marad as we mentioned, the one is sick or matter, any rain, or remember the last one? Khauf, fear. So these are the three excuses. Toim. So we discussed already the woman. Now as for the Musafir, then the proof that the Musafir is not upon him to pray Jum'ah is due to the fact that the Prophet wasallam did not pray the Jum'ah whilst he was at Arafah. And it was yani Jum'ah. And so this is used as a proof. If a person is upon the journey, if they are Musafir, then the Jum'ah is not an obligation upon them. Now the Jum'ah is not an obligation upon them. Thereafter, we have the one that is Ma'adur. I the one who has yeah, the excuse. And the first of those excuses that I mentioned is due to the Marad, yeah, due to the illness. And we mentioned previously regarding the, the Salah of the Murid. 
Like if the person is ill and that illness prevents them from attending the Jum'ah or yeah, attending Jum'ah, then of course it will prevent them from attending Jum'ah. And so if the illness is a reason for preventing them, then this is the case. And this is the case in relation to the illness, which is an illness, yurja burahu, so an illness where it is, it is anticipated that they will get better, inshallah. Naam. Or an illness where this is not anticipated. So, yani, the illness where it's, it's going to be understood, I will refer to as a chronic illness. Where it's understood generally that the person <laughs> may not get better from it. It doesn't, with respect to which, what the illness is, if that illness is a preventative factor in them attending the jama'ah, then it's going to be preventative from, uh, from them attending Jum'ah. Naam. As well as that, we have the matter, the rain. And the proof for that is that or the narration of Ibn Umar where, he, where the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in a time of heavy rain, he commanded the Munadi, yani the Mu'addin, to state upon, instead of the, the Adhan, to call the people with the, the words, Sallu fi rihalikum. I pray within your homes. And so this Nida, this address, was an address for the people due to the to the heavy rain for them to establish the prayer within their homes and not in the jama'ah. So, if it's understood that this is the case for the jama'ah, then this will be understood and allowed to Allah knows best for the Salatul Jum'ah. That if due to that, they're not able to attend, uh, to attend the Salah, then they pray the Salatul Jum'ah. In or they they uh, they don't pray Salat al they, they rather they pray Salat al within the homes. So the final uh, the final affair from these adhar uh, from these excuses or the, these reasons that excuses a person from the Salat al Jum'ah is the affair of khawf, yani fear. Naam that the person. As a degree of fear. And so, <coughs> the individual, we discussed previously that the individual may fear in his salah, mefalan, and the specific salah that the person prays, that they fear. Naam. However, if the individual Due to that fear, this now becomes a reason that they are prevented from praying the Salatul Jum'ah, then they are genuinely excused. What did we mention when we were mentioned, like the, the fear, uh, the, the Salatul Khawf generally last week? What was the fear pertaining to? War. So, yani, the fear of the Adu, the fear of the enemy. Naam. And so, what we understand from the affair of the fear is that it doesn't now negate the obligation of prayer itself. The person still has to pray. However, the person will adjust the manner in which they pray due to that particular fear. Naam, or the nature of the enemy. I where the enemy is, the position of the enemy. So, for example, from the from the conditions of the salah is istikbal al qibla. From the condition of the prayer is that the person faces the qibla. However, if now you know, for example, you're facing the qibla is this way, right behind us here. However, the enemy is coming from that way. Now, when they approach him, then you have the sukut. Yani or iskat of that particular condition. And that condition is removed. 
So the person doesn't now continue to just pray facing the Qibla whilst the enemy is behind them. Rather, they have the ability to face the direction of the enemy, but they still need to establish the Salah. Naam. Does anyone remember how we mentioned that there's other, there are many different uh, surah, yeah, there are many different manner, mannerisms of how this can be prayed. But we discussed one last week. Does anyone remember how it was? Half. You have two groups. You have two groups. And the first group prays with the Imam. The first group prays with the Imam. Then, after the first rakah, the first group goes and continues their salawat by themselves. This the first group prays with the salawat by themselves. What's the, what's the second group doing whilst the first group doing that? They're facing the enemy. Now, so this is in a scenario where they, they, one group can face the enemy. <coughs> now. And then the second group joins in the second rakah. The second group come and join the imam in the, in the, in the imam's second rakah. But it's the second group's first rakah. Now. And then they pray together and then the imam finishes. The imam finishes. By themselves. Make sense? The reason why I mention all of that and recap on all of that is to illustrate the manner in which yani, Shiddha to Khawf may impact upon the nature of how the person prays. And so if it impacts upon the nature of the Salah, then of course it's going to make the affair of establishing Jum'ah yani, difficult to impossible. And so due to that fear, the Jum'ah is not an obligation upon the individual. Naam. The Jum'ah is not an obligation upon the individual that fears. What's another manner in which a person may fear? So now we mentioned the enemy and that's an example of Salatul Khawf. How can a person also fear? Now, it's also mentioned that there's, just, there's a genuine fear for yani, your wealth. Now, from your wealth. So the person fears that if they are to leave something from their wealth behind, then this is then they will, uh, someone may come upon it and take from that wealth. Now, what else could be regarded as fear? Within that same thing as well, the wealth. So if you fear, for example, the wealth, i.e. Uh, fear is going to be stolen, man, then someone like they mentioned that this is a reason. This is regarded as a genuine fear. Okay? What else? This could be fear. And within that same dis- discussion of fearing for your wealth. Your livelihood, how? Huh? Allah Alam. The brain surgeon kind of, Allah Alam. Allah Alam. Not necessarily that, no. Your property. Your property. Now, what, something, something to do with property that they mention. Um, loss of it. Loss of it, now. How? <coughs> loss of property. How could your property be lost? Uh, Not enemy necessarily. You can't we'll leave it. No, we're talking about your property now. It's burning now. Burning. For example, now, if there is a fear that there's a genuine fear that you have something on fire, now, or something that is like naturally burning, for example, you're cooking, whatever, but you fear by way of leaving it, or you're not able to leave it for whatever reason, or you're not able to turn it off, this thing can happen. And you fear by way of leaving it that it's going to bring about damage or loss of property altogether, then this is also regarded as being a fear. Does that make sense? If you've got that curry goat on the stove. If you've got the curry goat on the stove. <laughs> or the, the, the Nahari and... <laughs> and Allah knows this. And then maybe there's, there's a fault and the person's not able to turn it off. Now, It's not now a case of person's like, okay, I have to, I have to play Juma. No, because it could be a case of that's, that's caused a, a greater loss, loss of property. That's, a, that's regarded as fear. Then we mentioned the fear 
um, alert, nafs. I so the person, all of that was fear upon your property, your, your wealth. The second is that your fear and a nafs. Naam. So you fear for yourself. You fear for yourself. And that is inclusive of what we discussed previously. For example, you fear for yourself about, of, of the enemy approaching. Naam. So if you're in a genuine war, war scenario, battle scenario, then the obligation, yani, the wujub of Jum'ah, yaskut, is removed from you. Likewise, fear upon oneself could be the case if the person is aware of uh, yani, a predator, a beast. If he's aware, for example, that if for him taking a particular path, which is always maybe his path to on his way to Jummah, but there's a particular beast on that path, that, that gen, that's a genuine fear, and he's now ma'adhur. To be fair, there's not a problem you're going to have in Manchester like that. Oh, Allah, Allah. No, I don't think you're going to face, face any, uh, any uh, predators in uh, Cheatham Hill, huh? Lamb. But this, this is not predators. These are not predators. These are, this is, if anything, that would be the closest, the closest thing to that would be you know, the adu, the enemy. And yeah, and you shouldn't fear them anyway because they don't have much strength. <laughs> now, as well as that, you have, so you have the fear from your wealth, the fear upon your, for yourself, and then the fear the third is the fear for other than yourself. For example, what? Children. Children. No. Your children. So, for example, a scenario, if you're in, you find yourself in the scenario that if, for whatever reason, for your attendance of the Jummah, maybe put jeopardy upon a child. No, you, you have, or you feel that like you're felt. Or you're in a scenario that if you were to leave, you have to leave the child. Or fear for another individual that may be regarded as da'if. Yeah, they're in a state, state of weakness. Naam. All of these things, whilst they're excuses, it doesn't now mean that the person should not mitigate for those circumstances. So it doesn't now mean that the person just accepts that as an excuse and they do not find, they do not try to find a way to remove those circumstances. So if you look at, for example, the person, he has a child. Naam, and he fears that he can't leave the child at home and attend the Jum'ah. Naam. Generally speaking, you go attend with the child anyway. But if he's in a scenario where he can't attend with his child, then in this scenario... Of course, he should strive to find someone that can look after the child. And not one where he's, he has to leave the child by itself, <coughs> defend for itself for, for that amount of time. But if now, for example, he doesn't seek that aid, now someone to aid him in that, in, that, in, that, in that regard, he cannot now say, I have an excuse though because the child makes what I said. No. Likewise, the person, he fears that if I take this path to Jum'ah, then I may face yani, a predator of some, court, of some sort. This doesn't now mean that he negates it in totality because there's many other paths he can take. And if he's aware that there's other paths that he take, that he will take are fine, where fees salama, then upon him is to consider taking those other paths. So, whilst, as you mentioned, these are genuine excuses, this is, these are excuses that the person can take, or these are valid for him, to not pray the Jum'ah, it doesn't now negate the fact that, that the person must try to mitigate the circumstance. Allah Ta'ala knows best. Now, thereafter... Now, we have the statement of 
Ibn Qadam, where he goes on to mention women, women sharat sihataha fa'alaha fi waqtiha fi Korea. وَأَنْ يَحْدُرَهَا مِنْ مَسْتَوْتَنِينَ أَرْبَعُونَ مِنْ أَهْلِ الْوُجُوبِهَا And so, what is mentioned as well is that the ones that have fulfilled those conditions, نعم, the ones that have fulfilled those conditions in order to يعني, pray, the Salat al-Jum'ah, and we said the conditions are how many? Five. Which is our five. And what are they? Here's the other. Persons are male now. There's puberty. There's sound mind. And he's now. He's free. So these are the conditions. Once he's reached those conditions, uh, he's reached those conditions, then upon him is to establish the salah. And he must establish it within its time. Nah, he must establish it within its time. And so, in relation to the time of Salat al Jum'ah, some of Ahlul Ilm, they mention that the time. For Salat al Jum'ah begins, the Sahib Salat al Jum'ah begins at the time where it is permissible to pray Salat al Eid. The time of Salat al Jum'ah begins when it's permissible to pray Salat al Eid, which is when exactly? After the sunrise. Naam. So you have some of the Ahlul Am from amongst the Hanabila, where they mention that the time is from when it's permissible to pray. Yani Salat al Eid. However, Shaykh and Shaykh Urbayt, Rahimahullah, he mentions that the Sawab, the correct opinion from the Sunnah, is, and that's what's Mustafid, or the Istifadat, and the Ahlul Ilm, the affair which is widespread and well known amongst the scholars, is that the waqt, the time of Salat al Jum'ah, is. After the Zawal. Yani after the Zawal, meaning after the midpoint, where the sun is at its most, or just after it's at its highest point. So just before the waqt of Dhuhr. Just before the time of Dhuhr. As this is when the person can establish the Salat, the Salat al-Jum'ah. Here Ibn Qudama as well, rahimahullah, he mentions... That it should be attended, the Salat al Jum'ah should be attended by those that are residents and have reached the number of 40. Da'am. And this is the opinion of Imam Ahmed or a riwayah and in Ahmed. It's a riwayah and a narration of Ahmed. What did we mention, what did we mention previously? When we say, we read, if we read in the books of Fiqh, and the book of fiqh will say, this is a riwayah on Ahmed. This is a narration from Ahmed. What is meant by that? Naam. Naam. So it's not, it's not related to uh, his Muslim. Naam. It's not, narrated, it's not related to a hadith that he's narrating. If we say that this is a position or this is a qawl, this is a, a, a particular statement, Naam, then... This is a statement rewired Ahmed. It means that this was something that was narrated from Ahmed. And there are other things that are narrated from, from him about the same mas'ala, about the same issue. Naam. So this is, this is an example of that. So in this issue here, what has been, what has been narrated from Ahmed is that he mentions, rahimahullah, that the, 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 the amount for the, to be, for, for the jama'ah to be considered to be a salat al jum'ah, which is sahihah, is... 40. Naam, the Salat al Jum'ah has to be 40. And so, due to that, Dhahaba ilay, due to that, Ibn Qudama rahimahullah adheres to that particular position, thus he mentions it in this book. 
However, and so this is the opinion of Imam Ahmed, also as well the opinion of uh, Sheikh Hassan bin Taymiyyah. He mentions, yani, uh, he mentions 40. However, the stronger opinion Allah Ta'ala knows best is that Jumu'ah is sufficient to be established by how many? Two, three, two or more, two or more, two, three. Anyone else? Are they all wrong? Huh? Are they all wrong? We'll see. <laughs> two, two or more, two, three. <coughs> what do we say? Ten. Ten. Ten? That sounded very guessy, but <laughs> 10, okay. <laughs> now, nah. what do we say? Three. Toy. You sound very confident with the three, so I'm going to ask you why three. Anything that? No. No. Right, so, because three is established, is, is regarded as a jama'ah, yeah. then this is the jama'ah. So good answer. That's wrong. You need two listeners and one khatib. So, you're saying three yeah. as well? Yeah. So you need two listeners and one khatib. Why do you need two listeners? Uh huh. So, who said two? He said, he said two is sat on the fence at the same time. Two to why? If there's two of you, you would have the prayers come down at one of you and you would have the elders to be deleted. The two of you? No. Essentially, no. It is two. And that can be used as a delete. Also, there's a narration which is even more uh, straightforward or more to the point, if you like, where it mentions that a jama'a is two or more. A jama'a, anything that regards the salat or jama'a is two or more. And essentially, salat or jama'a is a salat or jama'a. Now, salat or jama'a is a salat or jama'a. So we would regard this the number to be yani two. And the person established Salat al Jama'ah. It's also narrated in relation to uh, <coughs> Sheikh Al Bani, <coughs> Muhammad Ashraddin Al Bani, Rahimahullah. I, that he was upon this position as well, that he prayed with too. And he mentions that he would, he would go sometime, go with a companion of his, and they would pray Jama'ah together. And he, Rahimahullah, one of them would give the khutbah, the other one would listen, and then they pray the Salat al Jama'ah together. Now, I'm so too, Allah Ta'ala knows best is what is the stronger of the two in Allah Ta'ala knows best. Well, well there's a, another hadith of, you know, that man, Allah loved that man would go, go take his, would go sa'aw to the mountains in no. the Salah time. He'd do the Azan by himself, he'd do the Qama by himself, and then do the Jama'at by himself. No, but it's not Jama'at though. Because there's, there's, there's no Jama'at Except it has to be two or more. So he gives, he, he calls that, he calls that adhan, calls it a karma, and he prays, and he's established a prayer in the maktuba, the abrivishi prayer, but it's not regarded as the jama'ah. Ma'am, because jama'ah has to be two individuals or more. Because there's no jama'ah then. Because he's one by himself. Essentially, jama'ah, you had, there has to be an individual praying with them. No? Barakallah fikum. Now, So, thereafter, Ibn Khudam mentions where you have to cut them with her, Khutbatan, Fi Khuli Khutba, Hamdullah Ta'ala, Wa Salat ala Rasulihi, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Wa Karata Aya, Wa Mawaidah. And so, 
within this, you have the mentioning as well that the Salatul Jum'ah is preceded by two khutbas. It's preceded by two khutbas. Naam. Where Allah Ta'ala is praised and the Salah is sent upon the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and there's an admonition. Naam. So I sent upon the Nabi Alayhi Salatu Wasallam and an ayah is reciting an admonition. So, first and foremost, Ibn Qudama mentions that there's a khutbah thing, there's two khutbahs. Why does he mention there's two khutbahs? Naam. Essentially, what he's referring to is not that the khutbah is, is that the person gives one whole khutbah and he has another whole khutbah. Rather, what he's referring to is the fact that each khutbah is, or each time the person that the Imam speaks is regarded as being a khutbah. Naam. And the proof of that is the statement or the hadith which is found in Bukhari Muslim where it mentions and the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam kana yakhtub khutbatain yakhud baynahuma that the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would give two khutbahs and he would sit between the two. Naam, this is what is referring to the khutbah thing. So, thereafter, Ibn Qudama, rahimahullah, he mentions four particular, yani sifat, four particular, yani, uh, characteristics of that khutbah. Do you remember what they were? Four. Just read, just read them. Yahmad Allah. So he praises Allah. Second, a salah and a nabi alayhi salatu was salam. Yakra ayah. Yakra ayah. recites an ayah from ayah from the book of Allah. And it's within it is a mawaidah, an admonition. Naam. So we're getting the four. The praise of Allah, the, uh, the salah and a nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, kira'at ayah from the Quran, wa mawaidah. An admonition. With this barakallahu feekum, Shaykh al-Shaykh Ubaid, he mentions that this is not a shab. These are not shurut. So these are not, con- these are not conditions for the sihha of the khutbah. So these are, this is not conditional. So for example, it's not said now if the person, for example, does not mention the salah ala nabi, alayhi salatu wasalam, within the khutbah, that now the khutbah is batila. And then the salatu al is batila. La. Rather, he mentions, Shaykh Ubaid mentions, Muhammad, that this is a sunnah mu'akkada. Naam. That this is an emphasized and encouraged sunnah. That the individual, once they are, once they are uh, given a khutbah, that they establish a khutbah with these, each of these four things. Naam. And Allah Ta'ala knows best. Wustahab. And yakhtub ala minbar. Fiyya sa'ida akbal ala nas fa sallam alayhim thumma yajlis. Wa adhan al muadhin. Naam. And so, what is mustahab is that he gives the khutbah upon the minbar. Naam. He gives the khutbah upon the minbar. And so, this is the amr which is mustahab. Naam. Or. Ala mawdi, yani al, yani upon a, a high place, so that he's standing essentially above <coughs> the people li- listening in, <coughs> and once he ascends upon the minbar, he gives the salam. Naam, he gives the salam to the congregation. He gives the salam to the congregation. And thus sits down. And he sits whilst the Mu'addin gives the Adhan. So he, he stands, addresses the people with the, with the Salam, and then he sits down. ثُمَّ يَقُومَ الْإِمَامُ فَيَخْتُبْ ثُمَّ يَجْلِسُ 
Then the Imam, so after the Adhan, the Imam stands up and then he addresses the people, gives a khutbah, and then sits down. Then he gives the second khutbah. Naam. Thumma tuqamu salah fayanzil fayusalli raka'atin. And so the, then the salah is established by way of the ikama. Naam, by way of the ikama. So the ikama is given once the imam Naam has completed the khutbah. What is the difference between this and the ikama in this, in this, in this case and the ikama for the salat al jama'ah? What's the difference? Salat al Salat al Jum'ah. 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 What about in terms of where the Imam is or what the Imam does in relation to the Iqama for Jum'ah and the Iqama for the Jama'ah? One is? One is where he's entering the masjid. One is where he's entering the masjid. Maybe that's only here. <laughs> in this masjid, maybe that's the case. But the Imam enters, so that's when we give the Iqama. But the Imam might already be there. No. The imam might already be there. The place of the imam? <laughs> no. Yes. B- bit more though. How do we know that it's time to, to give the ikama for the Jum'ah? When he's finished the khutbah, when he's finished his salam. Okay, and then how do we know it's the time to give the, the ikama for the Salat al-Jum'ah? Well, it's in front of the Jama'ah. Yeah. So the Jama'ah, no. So, so the Jama'ah, we know that it's we, it's we know that it's time for him to give the or to give the Muaddin knows it's time to give the Iqama because the Khutbah ends. Now, so it's signified by the end of the Khutbah. The Salat of Jama'ah, how do we know it's time to give the Iqama? <coughs> The Imam is upon the Imam to give the ishara, now to indicate to the Mu'addin it's time to give the to come to give the ikama. Now, what you may find and what occurs a lot is that the Mu'addin he will give the ikama based upon what the clock says. Now, so if the clock is time for the salah, he'll give the ikama, irrespective of whether the Imam is jahis or whether the Imam is prepared and ready or not. Now. Essentially, the way that it should be it should be looked at is that the Imam, he's the one that is leading the people in this action of ibadah. Naam. And like anyone that is leading, any captain, if you like, that is leading a people in something, he is the one that gives the notice that this is about to begin. Naam. And it's not, say, for example, the person that's second in line to say, we're about to proceed. Naam. So it's the Imam, the Imam comes, if he gives the ishara to the to the muaddin, so he indicates to the muaddin that it's time to give the ikama, that's when the ikama is given. Naam. And it's not based upon i.e. times. And it's not based upon the people saying, where's the imam? Or the people maybe getting up, giving, you know, pressuring their muaddin like, we're going to get up now, so you better give the ikama. No, it's upon the imam that... He gives that ishara, he gives that indication that it's time to give the adhan. When it comes to the, uh, the Jum'ah, the Mu'addin or the Imam is already there. Now the Imam is already there. And thus, he, by way of his, uh, by way of his, his ending of the khutbah, now he then has made it clear that it's time to uh, uh, establish the salah. Now. What's also mentioned, and uh, Sheikh Abu Hassan Malik 
from uh, New Jersey. He done. Uh, he mentioned some points in relation to the khutbah and its ending. And generally, what you find when it comes to the end of the khutbah, um, that the muaddi or the imam rather will state the words wa aqimu salah, yani and establish the salah. Within the, the bath, within the, the research, he's mentioned. Uh, and it's and from apparently this is, this, this is the sawab as well. He mentioned Allah, that there is no actual asr now from the sunnah or the sharq, from the sunnah or the legislation that states that the imam will state this at the end of his khutbah. Naam wa aqimu salah and establish the salah. Rather, there should not be a need for that because at the end, as long as it's clear that the khutbah is ended, this is the ishara that the salah needs to begin because the salah follows the khutbah mubashatan. The salah follows the khutbah straight away. And so this is what we understand from this. And Allah Ta'ala knows best. Naam. Thereafter, Muqadama goes into mention, Yajhar fihima bi kira'a. And so, within this, the Imam, within the salah, he prays and he recites out loud. So he recites out loud. Naam. What we understand from this as well, Barakallahu Fikum, <coughs> is that this recitation out loud is ijma. There's ijma upon that. So there's a consensus that the Imam recites out loud for Jum'ah. What is from the Sunnah of the Nabi, alayhi salatu wasalam, I, from what he recites in the Jum'ah is that there are two sunan. Naam, there are two sunan. And this is found in the hadith of Abi Huraira, radiallahu anhu, where he mentions, Samitu Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, yakra bi surat al-jum'ah wal munafiqeen fi al-jum'ah. So Abu Huraira, he mentions that I heard the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam recite Surah Al-Jum'ah and Surah Al-Munafiqeen yani for Surah Al-Jum'ah. So we understand from that is that he recited Surah Al-Jum'ah first in the first raka'ah yani and Surah Al-Munafiqeen in the second raka'ah. So hadith found in Sahih Muslim. Likewise as well, you have the hadith of Nu'man where he mentions كان يقرأ يعني النبي عليه الصلاة والسلام كان يقرأ في العيدين والجمعة بسبب اسم ربك الأعلى وهل أتاك حديث الغاشية again narrated in Sahih Muslim and so he mentioned first and foremost that he صلى الله عليه وسلم in for صلاة الجمعة he would recite سبب اسم ربك الأعلى سورة الأعلى I that's the first rakah and the second rakah, hal attack hadith al ghashiyah. Yeah, and the second rakah, surah al ghashiyah. So both of them are regarded as being from the sunnah of Jum'ah. Some of the Ahl also mentioned that if you pray, if you recite once one of the surah from amongst the sunnah, naam, in one rakah, you must recite the second surah in the second rakah. So, for example, you recite Surah Al-A'la in the first rakah. You cannot now recite Surah Al-Kafirun in the second rakah. If you've established that, you recite, that in the first rakah you pray Salat, you, you recite Surah Al-A'la, then in the second rakah you have to recite Surah Al-Ghashiyah. Likewise, if the individual recites in the first rakah Surah Al-Jum'ah, then in the second rakah, he has to recite Surah Al Munafiqeen. Naam, and he can't differentiate between the Surah. <coughs> so, thereafter, I mentioned. Naam. Human Adraka Mahu Minha Rakatan Atemmaha Jumatan. Wa illa Atemmaha Dhuhran. And so, if the individual comes into the salah and he 
he, 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 he comes and he catches a raka. Then he completes his juma. So he completes one other raka. So for example, he comes and the imam's in the second raka. So he comes and the imam's standing in the second raka. For then he's reciting Surah Fatiha. Then once he's, the imam is completed, he stands up and prays how many more rakat? One more. One more. Now he's completing the salah. If now, for example, he misses both rakat. So, for example, he comes in and the imam is completed, then of course he has to pray dhuhr. If he comes in and the imam is sitting, naam in tashahud, then he has to still pray dhuhr. Naam, because he's missed both rakah. All we understand from this as well is that this is, uh, if you like, a refutation or rejection of those that claim that Salatul Jum'ah is actually like Salatul Dhuhr. And they will say that the two khutbahs is representative of the first two rakah al Dhuhr and the two. Uh, the two, so the two rakah, the rakatain in the salah is representative of two, the two, the, the last two rakah of dhuhr. No, because if the person was to dismiss one rakah of the salah, he only makes up one rakah, and he doesn't make up three because he's missed the khutbah. Now, upon him is to strive to attend the khutbah. However, if he misses the khutbah, he doesn't doesn't now it does not now mean that he has to make up some of the salawat. Nah, does it make sense? So rather, he only makes it up if he misses. I only praise Jumma if he misses both rakah. Nah. Well, I you Jews and you solely have the mis. أكثر من جمعة واحدة إلا أن تدعو الحاجة إلى أكثر منها. طيب. This is a message we were discussing a few weeks ago. I believe. Where Ibn Qadamah here is mentioning that it's not permissible to pray more than one Juma in an area unless there's a need for it. Now, so he's mentioning it's not permissible to pray more than one Juma in an area. Fadlan, pray more than one Juma in a single masjid. So the discussion we were having was about praying a Juma in a single masjid. Some of the Ahlul mentioned that they shouldn't pray more than one Jummah in an area. So let's say, for example, we have here Cheatham Hill. Of course, this is not the, the best of examples because this is only Salafi Masjid. But let's say the Cheatham Hill area, there's five masjids, five masajid. And the Muslims live in and around these masajid. Then there should be one masjid that everyone congregates in now it shouldn't be the case that everyone the, every single one of these masajid establishes salatul jum'ah now that's what you find as well for those that for those uh, that maybe lived in uh, saudi or medina not every single masjid in medina prays jum'ah now so you might turn up at your local masjid and there's no khutbah because not every single masjid prays jum'ah the Jum'ah is established in specific masajid. Why? Because it's a means of congregating the people of that particular area in one place. Now, So we say due to that, that the Jum'ah should not be established, generally speaking, in many different places in an area. So again, of course, this means that we shouldn't establish many different Jum'ahs in one masjid. The only time that you would establish Jum'ah in different masajid, is that that al haja if there was a need for that. Naam, for example, that the amount of people that live in an area are more than the capacity of the masjid. The amount of people that live in the area are more than the capacity of the masjid. So, that's when there's a need. But that cannot be said, again, going back to the mas'ala of praying, Two or three more Jumu'ahs in the masjid. Naam. This doesn't now mean that people can now say there's a need. Just because there's crowding doesn't mean now that there's an absolute need to do more than one Jumu'ah. Because also, if you do that, you establish more than one Jumu'ah in the masjid, what happens? What can it lead to? 
You need two more. Once you start, once you open that door and have two, what prevents you from having three or four? Now. Because now you can find that this becomes an action which people believe is mashru'. People believe it's legislating. It becomes a bid'ah. What else? The person prays a second, believing it's good for him, and then falls into a bid'ah. If he falls into a bid'ah, if he prays a second, and he believes it's good to him, good for him, then if he falls into a bid'ah, again, he, he may be the one that perpetuates that this is mashru'. This is legislating. What about the, the actual the people now? They value it less. Naam, of course. The people not congregated. Of course, the people not congregated, of course, splitting now. Exactly. Also, it can cause kessel. What? Tasahul. People become negligent regarding their Jum'ah. So the person, he's not striving to attend Jum'ah anymore. Think of the narration that, that encourages you to strive to attend the Jum'ah. To strive to be... Oh, salam. To be there before the Imam. To strive to be the first one there. If the person's attitude now becomes, I'm not even going to make it for the first Jummah. I'm going to wait for the third Jummah. Definitely. <coughs> so, then there's no more striving, there's no more ishtihad for the person seeking to attain that reward. And so many harms can come with that. And Allah Ta'ala knows best. So, Likewise, Mukhada mentioned, when you say, "Hab li man atal Jum'ah," and you accept it, or you leave the bain, or the fain, or the tayyib, now when you back it, ilayha. Well, that's what you mentioned. So, it's mustahab. Now, it's highly recommended, essentially, that the person performs a ghusl for Jum'ah. They wear the clean clothing for the Jum'ah. They perfume themselves. And they seek to attend early. Now they seek to attend early. Going back to what you mentioned, if there's two free Jumas, then there's no need for, or the person does not have that desire to attend early. Because their desire is to pray that Jumma that fits into whatever their schedule is, their work schedule, or, whatever, or even less than that. <coughs> now, thereafter, Ibn Khadama mentions for in for in Ja'al Imam Yaqtub Lam Yadlis Hatta Yusadi Rakatain. Nam Wayujis fi hima. And so if the individual comes to the Jum'ah, Nam, and the Imam is given the khutbah, then he does not sit down until he has prayed Rakatain. And he makes those those rakatain two short rakat, concise short rakatain. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Ashhadu Allah 
Now, and so if the person enters whilst the Imam is giving the khutbah, uh, then the individual must pray the rakatin. So he prays two short rakatin before uh, he sits down. And the proof for that is the hadith of Jabir and Abdullah. قال دخل الرجل والنبي صلى الله عليه وسلم يخطب فقال صليت يا فلان قال لا قال فصلي ركعتين and so جابر بن عبد الله رجع عنهما he mentioned that a man entered whilst the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم was giving a khutbah and so he stated, have you prayed the rakatin? Or have you prayed? You are Fulan. Right, before he sat down. He stated, no. And so the Messenger of Allah, so Allah said, in said, response, then pray. Likewise as well, finally, the Qudama mentions, وَلَا يُجُوزَ الْكَلَامْ وَالْإِمَامِ يَخْتُبْ and it's not permissible for the individual to speak whilst the Imam is calling or whilst the Imam is giving a khutbah. And the proof is the hadith of the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam where he mentions, إِذَا قُلْتَ لِصَاحِبَكَ وَالْإِمَامِ يَخْتُبْ عَمْسِبْ فَقَدْ لَغَوْتَ and so, Nabi Sallallahu mentions that if you say to your companion, whilst the Imam is giving the khutbah, and you be silent, be quiet, then you have fallen into an action of disobedience, an action of sin. As for the reason for this particular hukum, I, the person does not speak, is due to the fact that what is upon the individual during the khutbah is al is that they're listening, is that they're attentive. It's not possible for the person to be attentive while and listen in whilst they're speaking to another, whilst they're having a, a, a conversation with another individual. If it's the case that they're having a conversation, all they're speaking and they're, now they're not engaged fully with the khutbah and so with this case in this case then it would be said it would be said naam that the individual is not engaging us in the in the in the, in the khutbah and is distracted ibn qudama he mentions uh this an exception for when a person can speak during the khutbah and the exception for when a person can speak during the khutbah is if the imam himself is speaking to you. If the imam is speaking to you, then you may respond. What's the proof for that? The previously mentioned hadith. But the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, yani addressed the individual and asked him, did you pray? So he addressed him. And so... The man responded with la negative. He didn't had he hadn't prayed. Yeah, and the point being that he responded. And again, it goes back to the the hikmah of the one not speaking. That if now the reason for you not speaking is due to the fact that you are able to fully concentrate, and listen to the khutbah, naam, and take heed of what is within the khutbah. If the imam is speaking to you and addressing you then of course you're going to be able to speak because the, you no longer listen to the imam's khutbah yeah, but you're addressing the imam and his speech towards you. And so thus, within that, it is uh, permissible for the person to speak and that is, uh, Allah Ta'ala knows best, an exception. And that is what we have here, Jazakum Khair, from some of the ahkam wal fawaid relating to Salatul Jum'ah, and as we mentioned, this is the final discussion or final part of Kitab al-Salah. Walillahi alhamd. And in our next 
lesson, inshallah, we will begin with the Kitab of Janais. In the, the chapter pertaining to the funeral. Wallahu ta'ala, a'lam. Wa baraka la fikum, wa jazakum, wallahu khaira. Wa sallallahu wa barak ala nabiyyina Muhammad, wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam.